Okay. So we can Good. call the meeting to order for the regular school board meeting. And any um, any adjustments to the agenda? There's just not a celebration of learning tonight. No celebration of learning. That's number nine. We'll just cross it. Nothing to celebrate. There's lots <laughs> There's to celebrate. Lots to celebrate, There's not a special celebrate. presentation. <laughs> lots to celebrate. All right. So hearing nothing else, uh, well, amending, taking uh, number nine off. Any other adjustments? If not, just need a motion to approve the agenda as amended. Motion to approve the uh, adjustments to the agenda. Second. Okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. So, first up to approve the meeting minutes of Tuesday, January 16th, which was the regular school board meeting. Uh, motion to approve the minutes of Tuesday, January 16th. Second. Second. Any discussion on it? Hearing none. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Hi. You and I, Rodney? He was away. All right. Gotcha. And uh, public comment? Probably won't necessarily be going over the budget, but anything else? Tammy? Yeah, uh, we can barely hear you at this point, Tammy. Okay, hold on. Oh, it's getting better. A little better. Okay, can you hear me now? Yeah. Really good. Okay. Um, there's no coverage of budget items in the agenda, um, which is a change from last month's projection. Like, we were estimating to be covering those things, but it's not here. Um, so, because it's silent, there was a change of some sort. Will it be discussed at the facilities task force update later on in the agenda? What is she talking about? Um, can, can you repeat that again, Tammy? I think we lost you a little bit on that. I'll try to type it out. I'm having computer problems. Are you looking for an update on the upcoming bond vote? Is that what you're asking? Yes. Yeah, we can cover that under Facilities Task Force. Okay. It just wasn't an agenda item, and last month it was projected to be. Um, so That's I correct. Understand yep, and we, we'll and explain that. Yep. Okay. It's been a little busy with budget season. Yeah. Yeah, so we'll get to that uh, about midway through, Tammy. Okay. All right. Any other public comment? Can I speak as public? Sure. Okay. Or your parent, grandparent. Um, I'm concerned about R1 bus. We seem to be having a problem with it hitting a few rows. It <coughs> screws everybody else up, especially the people who live on Mill Road and that area and Dairy Hill Road. So I don't know what's being done to try and deal with that issue. What is the specific issues that they're having there? Um, like the roads are bad. The road itself roads. or the bus? Okay, I guess. That's well, right. it's the roads. It might be the bus driver. I don't know because they, the last one was, oh, we, we get a notice that the very last minute, well, he can't do Happy Hollow Road because they're working on the road. But my understanding was they were just York raking it. So it was no big deal. But yeah, sometimes I think the bus could have gone, but hasn't. So do we feel that that's a, a busing thing, or is that a, a town yeah, so, maintenance um, piece? Or? I, I've been trying to navigate this. Thank you, Peggy. I've had the same question, right? And it's the one bus that we've been having issues with across the SU in general. It's the one roof. It's the that, only bus. It's the only yeah. bus that uh -huh. keeps getting routes canceled. Um, so the bus company had concerns as well. And they are navigating it with the town, but also the driver um, to make certain that that, and th it has, they, they have been very clear that, that there should be no unilateral canc canceling of a bus route. 
they're in agreement with that, oh, okay. the bus company. Um, so yes, it's a concern. After my last conversation with the general manager of the bus company, I think we've got it sorted out. But thank you. I agree. My kids do like getting home earlier. But <laughs> yeah, no, I've been really concerned yeah, in general for the whole route. Like mm, it's, yeah, it's, it's just, horrible. yeah, it's not good. So did that start out as a normal, like the thaw, mud season, you know, there's been issues. issues into more, there's been issues with a couple storms in that particular route. Um, and then this week, or was it this week or was it last week? Late last week. Was it this week? Monday? Monday, I guess. Was it Monday? I don't remember. That there was road work being done. Um, but I think we were looking into, like, the sense that the bus could have still passed even though there's road work. I know. Well, I mean, we can't keep up with the seasons right now. It's mud, yeah. mud winter, back to mud again. We're so. sugaring now. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Snowstorm tomorrow. Yeah. So. Yeah. Any any other public comment? Okay. Seeing none. We'll close public comment. Uh, move to board comment. I was just going to throw out there, and, and Jeff luckily was able to come in like at the very end, but like the middle school has been hopping here in that gym. Like it, yeah, that's cool. It is, it is a, an experience like any other experience. It's been fun. When we finally were able to have home games, thank you, Jamie, for stop canceling them. Um, <laughs> we were able, I mean, we, it's rocking. Like it's, I mean, it's always a tight gym anyway, so you don't fit a lot of people, but it, it becomes really loud. And you have the cheerleaders in there. Um, I mean, we've had really good support from parents and friends and neighbors, and everybody's come out to the games, and um, it's pretty exciting, man. You know, really close one tonight, and um, what's really exciting is we have large numbers of kids, which, you know, Jeff and I have been talking about, like, how do we move those kids up through, but, um, I mean, and it goes back to the budget and stuff like that is, you know, this is the place to be right now in the area, and, and we have large amounts of kids, I mean, sit, you know, you know, 16, 17 kids on a team to come out and play basketball or soccer. Or, you know, I mean, they're large numbers. Now, it's going to take a little doing because it, it can be kind of, it's a good complicated problem to solve. Um, but um, we have awesome numbers. We have cheerleaders. Um, the cheerleaders mostly are all eighth graders, so they're going to be moving to the high school level. So we were just talking about, you know, how do we receive them up through and then we have the youth sports cheerleaders that will be coming back up through. So it's like, you know, we've, we've established kind of a, a pretty good pattern of cheerleading that hopefully will be sustainable for a while. So that it's another uh, activity that is available for, for kids. So that's great. I'd like to tag on to that, that I see that a lot of other really great things are happening here too for kids after school that maybe sports isn't their thing. Like I know that... Uh, Dungeon and Dragons on Mon or on Tuesday afternoons. They've been having a big crowd in here. Um, Drama Club on Fridays, I believe it is. I don't know. But anyways, there seems to be a lot going on here after school. And it's great because middle schoolers especially, they need something to do after school. And so they're, they're getting opportunities that are fantastic. Okay. Any other board comment? Okay, here none. We'll move on. We've got the uh, reports to the board. Start with Jamie. So you have my um, written report in hand. Um, I talked quite a bit about 127 and things. I mean, in general, you know, in the legislature, I expect H850 to have action and a governor's signature. By the end of next week, I would think, um, one would hope. Um, you know, we do, actually, we had our first um, district in the supervisory union um, cancel their warned vote under Act 1 of a provision of COVID-19 uh, that was provided last year, tonight, actually. Um, and so the good news in White River Unified District is, is that we have a budget that was well under a cap and that I believe that any um, changes provided via H850 is gonna result in an increased yield, 
which is a positive result on the tax rates for Bethel and Royalton. So that's really good. Um, other legislative business, they took testimony uh, in the House Ed Committee today on this proposed uh, cell phone uh, bill banned. Um, and I, I can't quote that number right now of that bill. I'm sorry. Um, it came out of the Senate. And um, in the Senate Ed Committee, um, Dr. Levine actually gave the testimony today. You know, I would say that there's uh, pieces of that bill that make some sense to me in regards to how much of a distraction technology can be within our school walls. Uh, the notion, though, that schools couldn't communicate the good work it's doing via social media to the outside community, which I think is one of the ways we give parents a picture into what we're doing is our pictures mm -hmm. via social media. Um, I just can't imagine not allowing us to do that. That's part of that bill. Uh, another piece of that bill is it would require us to essentially provide a whole pathway for kids that resulted in them not engaging in the use of technology uh, as an instructional tool in the classroom. It says they cannot access a uh, computer and or um, other methods of technology for instruction. Um, I don't think that that's setting up ourselves up for kids to be college and career ready. I think they need to know how to use technology. So there are provisions of that bill that, um, that the VSA uh, and the VPA has spoken against. And you um, said that's in the Senate? That's, that's coming out of the Senate, yeah. And the Senate uh, Ag Committee took testimony on that bill today. Um, so that's just one to follow. Um, and then the other big one, of course, is HH50. There's um, one of the ones we got to watch closely, too, is um, this. Uh, the House is still looking at how do we try to create um, uh, opportunity for funding to deal with uh, school facilities and deferred maintenance. There has not been any state funding specifically for capital improvements since 2007. Um, and so the House, the House Ed Committee is the one that's really taken the lead on that. I'm going to be curious to see if once we get H50 passed, can they actually start to focus on some other work? I would say in general, it, the Ed Committees have been very, very focused on this HH50 uh, in regards to 127 and some of the other things that they were trying to take up has sort of been paused. Um, the only other thing I would say that is worth noting is out of appropriations, there's some marijuana tax money that was, uh, was linked to the Ed Fund. And it's, it's not a lot, it's like three and a half million, but that they want to take out of the Ed Fund for after school programming and set aside uh, in the general fund that um, private entities could apply to get. I, it's, it's a curious thing of why they want to take this sum of revenue that was devoted toward the Ed Fund for after school activities and put it in this other pot that could be uh, accessed by a broader stroke of individuals. Um, and I just say it's worth watching because um, there, it, just this whole notion of pulling money out of LEAs and the type of after school programming you're all talking about that we're providing kids and then um, cutting down on some of that revenue that we could use to then be accessed by private um, and, and independent entities is just a concern for me. Um, as a public educator and, and in general, you know, we're the game in town for providing our kids after school opportunities. I don't see someone coming in here and being able to do that. And so that money being able to support our 21C programming or our club <coughs> and things, I think is really important. So that's just one that I, that, that I've been paying quite a bit of attention to, even though it's not a big sum of money, because I do worry about what's that trajectory if you play it out. So I just wanted to mention that one. Otherwise, um, you know, I, uh, I'm excited about the group that we're pulling together to start to look at. I wanted to highlight this to you. Uh, a, a new um, student information system. We're really interested in getting a system that's easier uh, for our teachers and our admin to use, but also that's easier for our families to use, that we're, we're able to better communicate 
in real time with families about how kids are achieving and doing. Um, and so we are interested in, in being able to start to implement a new program uh, after the first of next year. This is something we've budgeted for um, that then would take solid effect um, in school year 25-26. I only want to add something because I know I'm going to forget it if I wait. And it doesn't really have, it has something to do with information for parents. No, that's all right. So when we take, when we set out the text messages for parents, sometimes if you have kids that are in both campuses, the text message, you don't necessarily know which campus it's from. So it's good to know. Um, there were some texts that were sent out within the last day or two, and I had to actually scroll up the text message pretty far to find out which campus it was from. So it doesn't come through and say, like, high school or Royalton campus or Bethel campus. So if you have children in both campuses, sometimes it's kind of, you're trying to figure it out um, where it's coming from, I guess. Thank you. Yeah, that's good feedback. Especially if it doesn't have, like, a click link. Like, it, it might have been yours that you sent out. <laughs> saying that something was going to be following. Oh, it was the incident at school. Yeah. It said something would be following. But I'm like, which campus is this? <laughs> like, I couldn't figure no, out which campus. That's, that's good. No, yeah, so that's maybe something to we think could about. Note it when, yeah, when yeah, we do it. An easy fix, yeah. Oh, and then the other thing I really wanted to highlight, this this is one plan that's been working on this. It's, it's part of what Principal Bowen uh, started working with, is that for the first time, we're actually offering um, after school programming on the Royalton campus during the February break to pilot this. Um, it is something that we're just starting. The idea is to grow that um, and possibly be able to have programming at multiple campuses across the SU um, for February and April moving forward. Uh, but also we're looking at the idea of being able to uh, up our, after our, our summer programming up to seven weeks. Um, and so I just wanted to note that I know that was concerns folks had about how could we ex expand and just want folks to know that we're, we're working to make that happen. I'll take any questions folks have. All right, seeing no questions, we will move forward with the principal's update. Uh, I'm happy to go with the elementary first. Just uh, summarizing that I've, the the beginning for elementary is just summarizing what we've been doing on our half days on those PLC times, uh, working on training up more on some of our assessments. Uh, I've listed out some of the classes our teachers are are been signing up for to take. Uh, also highlighting what our wildcat groups have been working on on Fridays. So the character strengths of love, cheering on others, forgiveness, social intelligence, and perseverance. Uh, and we've been applying that yesterday, specifically during the spelling bee. We had people persevering and cheering other ones on, others on. Uh, we just finished our track by progress. And so we've been working on looking at that data with our data teams. And then there's, if you click the link, you can see all of our fantastic students of the month in elementary there. Uh, our math team wrapped up our math pilot and um, we didn't have a clear winner, but we are going to transition to Bridges Math. Even though our scores are amazing, we, uh, I think the determination is that we want a more hands-on approach to teaching math for kids. So we're going to do a three-year transition from Envision Math to the Bridges Math, uh, which was one of those things we've already budgeted for, but that's just the update on that. And um, finally, what was the final thing? Um, we are just so happy to have the highlights that we got in the Herald for our Snowcats program, which if you didn't see that, you should look it up because it was a really lovely article written by one of our parents at the Royalton campus who's been helping out with their skating program. She also works at the Herald and she's been given Thursday afternoons off to, to help, so she also took it upon herself to write a nice article. We also were highlighted for um, Francie Slater's great work with Farmer School and all the all the grants she's received. Um, and yeah, uh, finally, we're going to be working with the local library in Royalton to celebrate the works of Dr. Seuss on March 1st. So we're excited to do that. It's also going to be in partnership with some of our high school students who are going to be coming down um, and leading those activities, which is always fun to mix it up with our high school friends. And then I think the final uh, thing was we had some 
microaggression training with Dana Decker, who was leading us through um, education around equity, and uh, that was, was really eye-opening and thoughtful for our elementary teachers also. So that's the elementary section of the report. Okay. <coughs> Pardon me. Good evening. A few things I would like to highlight in the middle school principal's report. Uh, I've tried to give you a snapshot of where folks are now. So in terms of how we're using data, the kinds of um, deep dives we're doing right now, we're looking at our winter assessments and benchmarks compared to fall and seeing if some of the universal instructional pieces that we put into place have had an effect as well as some of the targeted interventions. Uh, so that work continues. I do want to clarify one of the points I had put in my principal report. This district is phenomenal in what it offers people for professional development. For example, what we have access to, um, countless outside agencies, agencies of education, other partners, looking at how we dive into data, how we structure our uh, curriculum, how we look for those ties between content areas. I was trying to highlight that in addition to the offerings of this district, we also have a, a phenomenal crew of educators who are taking advantage well beyond what the district offers and engaging in some professional development that has direct application to their work here. We have people that are becoming certified in uh, wildlife interpretation and bringing that into science classrooms. People that are looking at how um, functional everyday math can be tied into more abstract concepts. Just something to be proud of that we truly do have a group of uh, lifelong learners. In terms of how we're serving the community and how we're <coughs> building stronger connections to various things out there, our food service program deserves some celebration. Often you hear about quality of food. It could be better. Not unique to this campus, just generally said about schools. I have to give Misha and her crew uh, a big thank you. Uh, we were finding that students coming in in the morning weren't accessing breakfast necessarily for a variety of reasons, and she and her crew came up with a solution that offers, we call it the second chance breakfast, but in reality for many of the students, it's the first breakfast. And we've increased the number of students who are actually taking breakfast by 50%-ish. A pretty substantial rise. And not only are we giving them nutritious food, but it's also minimized the amount of transitions during those first two blocks of the day. Students aren't getting hungry and going out for a snack. They're present for class. There's a, a specific time they're getting that food. Um, and I know it's a question on a lot of our campuses. How do we feed our students and make sure uh, they're fueled up for the day? A uh, couple of other things I would like to highlight. Pulling out a loose thread, trying to find pictures of this campus back in the day, meaning back from the 50s, 60s, 70s, I reached out to the Historical Society. Just, hey, what do you have in your, in your coffers, in your archives? They gave it some thought, they did some searching, and then they came back at us with two wonderful opportunities. One is an essay contest for our students, um, writing about what Memorial Day actually means to them. How does it relate to their lives? And also, uh, figuratively throwing open their doors for any group that wants to go down and do a tour of the archives. And we're really looking at how we can capitalize on that opportunity. Um, it's important for students to see themselves carrying on a, a positive tradition, having links back to things that this town, this community, these towns are proud of. So we're very thankful for those kinds of relationships that seem to be building. The last thing I would note is we continue to look at how to evolve our Flexible Pathways program to meet a variety of different needs and really find ways students can engage in those passion projects. We see clear links between that Pathways program and where we're headed with capstone projects. And recently we've begun, I'm not begun, recently we've had a number of outside professionals from a wide range of different job settings coming in and talking to students. Quite often there are former students, so we have people that have gone on to a variety of careers coming back in and talking about preparedness. What did I need to know then? What track do you need to start thinking about? How do you prepare yourself uh, to broaden your options? I think we have an opportunity to look at an even wider range of different career paths as we start digging into um, various things that this community, surrounding area, the county is known for. And I do have something for you. It's not a gift. It's a thank you. 
for your support for the makerspace. Andrew and Rodney, you'll have to collect yours at a different time, but they're right here. These were produced on our epilogue laser engraver. This is a very simple, this is yours, Rodney. It's a very simple task when you get down to it, but it requires a number of uh, technical skills. The reason I'm handing these out is a reminder that the adults are learning how to use this setup. But we've already had students becoming engaged in what we're doing in there. Some out of simple curiosity. Um, we have a number of students who are now doing some tech repair, learning how to use the programming. Uh, it's pretty exciting. You're starting to see a return on that investment of time and energy. Thank you. These are little 3D uh, etched tokens. For tech. That was a student uh, idea. They saw something we were working on as a prototype and said, hey, you know what would be really nice? How about you make one large enough that we could put it on a keychain? Okay, voila. So we thank you for your support. Thank you. Thank you. Those are awesome. Ooh. Tough act to follow there. <laughs> yeah, what when you, you got bring it <laughs> <laughs> oh, All right, so I just got a couple highlights from the high school. <laughs> So I, I, I'm pretty excited about um, the fast bridge assessments that we've been working on. Our high school um, did some professional development on the Adams, um, supported them, and got some resources. So our English and math department spent four hours with that. Our leadership team is looking into a new schedule to help support our students. And one of them, we had a scheduling meeting today, and it was, what's important in your schedule? And it's lunch, and it's funny, you know, and you say, well, why is it lunch? And it's because if you've been to our lunch, and you've seen that line, we have a lot of kids now trying to get through that lunch line, and a lot of them aren't eating because there's not enough time. So one of the big schedule changes will be to have two lunches so that kids have time, mm -hmm. proper time to eat, because kids are just blowing it off because they don't want to wait in line. So um, that's one of our... We have uh, started Transition Math to help support student needs, uh, Lit Lab to help support, and that was from the data, that was from the FastBridge um, assessments. Um, one of the uh, interesting things, just in our faculty meeting on Tuesday, Michaela Martin came in, and as a parent, you know, you have those moments where you're just kind of really proud of your kids, and they just make, you know, like, you tingle. Well, the other day at our faculty meeting, I actually tingled. It was like Michaela was up there and everyone moved their chairs up and they were all engaged and they were all interested in, in finding ways to help our students improve. And it was just like, wow, I'm, like, I'm still excited about that. And when I, I mentioned it to one of the teachers, they're like, yeah, well, we really care, but we just have never had this, this opportunity to know how to use this data. So it's pretty exciting. Um, we celebrated, I love celebrations, we celebrated at Tanner. Drury uh, Thousands Point. Um, it was a huge night. I think anytime you can showcase your school and invite people, it was, it was definitely well attended. Um, and then it wasn't a, a just last weekend or the weekend before the Cancer Awareness Games. Again, the packed house, having all those people come through our doors, you know, and it's like, again, you can't sell our school any better than those games. And I, and I, Opportunities. And it wasn't hot in there this year. Not this year. We got that built. They're working well. <laughs> sure. But it was standing room only. At one point, people were sitting it in the was, aisles. It was awesome. Yeah. yeah. If you have never been, it's just, you got to just go and see that. It's quite amazing. Which one was packed? Because Thousand Point or the Cancer both, Awareness? Both, both actually, yeah. They yeah. both were. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Thousand Cancer Awareness was, yeah. was probably yeah. the most Three times times ever yeah. 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 Oh, It was literally it. standing room only. Yeah. Thanks, Pam. Yeah. Thousand points too, though. Yeah. That's cool. I didn't know we could do that. So is the thousand points only in high school? Yeah. Like your entire sports school. And it's just ours. Yeah. It's COVID, so she sophomore year. I think she only like sophomore year. Like, how do you even like do that? Like. You're gonna like, what, 50 points a game, 70, 60, wow. That was close. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Too long. Did we want to take some time to go through the winter data assessment now, or? Yeah. 
Yep. I don't know if people want to take a few minutes to look at it first or if you want us to talk about it first, because it can be either. Let's talk about it. I will talk while you look. <coughs> so yeah, celebrate that. I'm I'm here to celebrate. So I think what you'll see in the elementary is the greatest growth is both in literacy and math in the kindergarten through second grades. Uh, but we know that all the data in the elementary exceeds the winter expectations based on the, based on the state estimates. So we're really happy. Um, we don't have any data to support this, but anecdotally, the last two years, we've been um, doing a Bridges math in our preschools. And so we think that that is, our kids are coming with a better baseline knowledge of math um, when they get to kindergarten. So we, we think that's one of the things that's, that's helped us out in the math department. Um, and overall, our numbers um, of kids that are scoring below the standard has decreased. So generally, it's in the elementary, we are seeing growth in all areas and are super proud of our progress. Super proud. Not giving up, though. Just always, we can do better still. but. So in terms of the middle school, we do have some things we'd like to celebrate in math and ELA. Um, specifically, I'd like to point out so why we think that's happening. Um, when I, in my just my tenure in this district, I've seen a number of opportunities <coughs> provided uh, to collaborate. What I mean specifically is getting cross departments to get together <coughs> and really look at how they're approaching um, a piece of literature, making sure things like what they call mentor texts are in place. So students have an on ramp <coughs> to complex ideas. Uh, I think we are likely seeing students come in with stronger and stronger foundational skills. If I was going to make a bold prediction, I would think we're going to continue to see, you can call it a gap, you can call it missing foundational skills. We're going to start to see those diminish more and more, given the work that they're doing in the elementary school in particular by using a very highly functioning data team, diving in, <coughs> matching appropriate intervention and supports, identifying those foundational skills. Our students are showing up in sixth grade stronger and stronger, and I see that in students that are coming from our sister schools as well. So not only is it the investment of really focused, intentional, identifying texts that are accessible, engaging, and, and bridge that gap between the concrete and the abstract. Um, in terms of math, <clears throat> Not only is it having that collaborative time as a math department, it's looking at different ways they can make math real, keeping um, that real-world connection to the concepts that they're dealing with, and also taking the time to step back and say, okay, X number of students are missing this particular skill, let's focus on that. Let's pre-teach, teach, come back to it, and then move on. So intentionality and collaboration, I think, is one of the reasons why you're seeing um, significant, when I say significant, that's in my perception. I'm not talking about statistically significant. We did run chi-square routines on these, but we're looking at 10% or better between fall and winter improvements, kind of across the board in terms of students who are approaching, meeting, or even exceeding proficiency. So we'd like to celebrate the fact that in just a few short months, uh, the hard work and efforts and the support of the district, the work they're doing in the elementary school, I think we're seeing the dividends, and it's kind of a privilege to see in just my short time here. At the high school, we're excited to see what the <coughs> change is going to be in the spring, because this is really our first go of it with the Fast Bridges assessment. So we'll have more data in the spring. Are you, even though we don't have internal data to compare, is there, is there data that you can compare with, like, um, Regionally or, or statewide or yeah, I believe there is actually and how I haven't dug into know. that so much. that would love yeah. yeah, I know it's tough when you don't have a benchmark, you know, the right. against, but maybe you can compare it versus yeah, you know, neighboring schools if they're using the same program. It's interesting to, to note that not many high schools are using this fast bridge. I think we're kind of the one, you know, so it's hard to get some data from other schools, but that's something I will ask. And I probably should know this, but do we, I, I imagine we keep track of placement with high schoolers as they move, you know, who, who enters the workforce, who goes to a trade school, who goes to college, yeah. et cetera. We, we keep track of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I'll add in the high school, this is like baseline for them because remember we used Star 360, we moved to Track My Progress, which was just, um, it's K through 8. 
Um, and then so we've been trying to search on what we were going to use for the high school. And so we're using FastBridge now. Uh, one of the things, though, that I was incredibly proud about with the high school faculty is um, that they're very interested in the work that their colleagues are doing around analyzing data at the um, elementary level. And so uh, Jeff had teachers from his leadership team come observe an elementary data team so that they can then use those skills to put them into practice at the high school. Um, and as someone who's, you know, been pre-K through 12 as an administrator, I used to say to my high school teachers all the time, like, if you want to go see classroom management, go watch your colleague in kindergarten. Because what kindergarten teachers can do is magical. Uh, when you look at how they are able to run their classes, facilitate learning with a small group, all the other kids are engaged in on-task activities, right? And they're not directing the learning, like they're facilitating. Um, and so to see high school teachers take the opportunity to actually come to the Bethel campus to observe some elementary teachers, I just think it really spoke to our high school teachers' commitment to use data to best try to meet our kids where, where they're at. You know, I think we're gaining all the time in that work, um, but there's a real appetite to do the work. And I'll say to you, like, that's not always common in high schools. Uh, but, I, you know, I, our high school staff is very, very committed to meeting our kids where they're at and to try to best support them. Um, and that type of climate and culture goes a really long ways in the work we're trying to do, um, that we have that commitment to want to do that work. And so I'm pretty excited, and I know that they were talking about data teams and meeting in it earlier this week, too. Yeah. Um, and there seemed like there was some excitement from that. So I think there's the, real, the right mindset to really leverage this data to result in better outcomes for our kids. And that's good. And the other thing is I, I think Andra, um, you know, I, I looked at the data. I don't hand out um, acknowledgement easily. No. <laughs> uh, but um, I gotta say, I was so excited and proud about the gains that we're seeing at the elementary. Now. Um, specifically, if you look at our math, we had set some goals to be above the state benchmark by 2025, and we're essentially there in each grade level at the elementary now. That's really exciting, um, and you can see the lit the literacy work that we're really focusing on in those those primary grades. It looks like it's paying off. Um, so, yeah, I I'm, I'm feeling uh, optimistic about the direction we're headed academically. So, it's, it's good. And, and definitely looking at the data from fall to winter, I mean, you can see pretty much across the board the improvements at all of those levels. The one question I, or question slash concern I had is we, we had identified um, a year and a half ago, we identified the group which at that time were seventh and eighth graders that they were in math was was an issue with proficiency uh, obviously you have the ninth graders now they're now eighth and ninth graders mm -hmm. and it does still show that the eighth graders math anyways are still lagging behind so what is our game plan for them as Jeff receives them for next year to to continue that improvement with them yeah so um, middle school is working continuously to fill gaps mm -hmm. Um, and what I would say is that the, L the high school now has implemented during their pathway band um, an intervention block, but that also kids are going to earn proficiency and credit in um, through a new program that we've started this year called Transition Math that um, gets kids, it, it, one, it assesses them and helps the teachers place them around where their actual gaps are. Um, meaning, is there gaps actually multiplicative reasoning, and that's what's getting in the way of their understanding of fractions, right? And if we don't have good sense of fractional reasoning, it makes algebra really hard. Um, and so what we've done is, is that we've got, I was actually pretty excited to see it at the high school uh, last week, is that we have multiple math teachers working with a group of students who we've identified that have those gaps 
And they're all being placed and then supported by not just one teacher with a, in a room of 20. We've got three folks working with a group of 20 to work with those kids specifically on the skills that they're lacking in. Um, and so this is our first time using transitional math. Uh, we just started in January. But our hope, Chris, is based on some work we've done with that in our personalized learning classroom, is that you know the goal really is within a 12-month period that we'll have closed those gaps and that those students are going to be successful in Algebra 1. Um, and what we saw was in Algebra 1, kids just didn't have the skills. And you know, algebra starts off slowly, but then it go and if you lose them here, right, then they're gone. And so they kind of gave up. And the, the comments, and I'm not even asking kids, they're coming to me and saying, thanks for this transitional math. I feel like I'm successful and I'm moving forward and I'm understanding. And it's just like, these are kids coming to me. I'm not even asking. So I think this is really exciting. And then they'll be prepared to take algebra next year. And do we feel that the, the, the now ninth graders that we had identified last year, do we feel that they are up to standards now or are they still kind of sort of lagging behind or they're that, still lagging but yeah. they're they're getting those skills that they need so that they'll be prepared next year for algebra one not yeah, so, all lagging right but a subset absolutely oh yeah 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 that group that we're talking about that, yeah i would like to add a piece to that <clears throat> it really highlights something jeff just said that's really a key um when a student's coming up to a principal and saying i feel successful that's the litmus test. That's the canary in the coal mine in the best possible way that that student is likely going to be engaged, is going to be asking questions and applying it to the world around them. This year, we looked at a group in terms of how they were making progress, not on this kind of chart, did they fall into proficient or approaching. We looked at the progress they were making relative to where they were. And in many cases, we have students who are missing a, a wide variety of foundational skills. I keep using that phrase. We have a math class now that is as large as any other math class. It's a full class where it is team taught with a special educator um, to really hammer out different ways of approaching those foundational skills. Um, and again, looking at not this kind of a chart, but how is that specific student making progress and digging down deeply into things like track my progress, the tools we have, we can identify where we need to focus on so long story short is we have a class built around where those foundational skills are to try and not have cohorts where we say, okay, well that cohort's just not filling the blank. Um, and I think it's really, again, trying to get after what Jeff just mentioned. A student can feel successful, can build skills, can see how things tie together, can see the progress they're making relative to themselves. Uh, there's been a lot of success coming out of that one particular class. Just for the record, I'm not taking credit. It was one of those brilliant ideas you just get out of the way of. <coughs> and people read it. Okay. All right. Anything further in regards to the academic data? Okay. Hearing none, we will move forward. We've got the uh, business manager. So you all have my report. It outlines what's happening in the business office during the month of February, um, as well as what I have to do for our school food authority responsibilities. And then what I don't put on here is all the budget stuff that we are doing. I see a lot of you have your mailers, so hopefully all Bethel Royalton residents got their initial mailers in the mail in the last couple of days. So yeah, we actually received our mail. Yep, Spalding nice. Press does an amazing <laughs> job always get it. again for us. So, yeah, that's what we've been doing. So if there's any questions specific to that part of my report, otherwise <coughs> I'll come back for the um, audit discussion. I did provide in my report, Parker, if you want to go to uh, the quarter two projection of where we stand in fiscal year 24 currently, and I'll just go over that real quick with you. Which side are you on? Are you on the rev? You're on. Can you go to the expense page? There we go. Thanks. Yeah, you're good. So it's your last page in your packet. It's flipped over in the packet. So through quarter two, um, we primarily look at your salaries, budget versus contracted. So right now, based on the positions that have filled and the contracts that have been issued. 
We have a projected savings in that line item of just over 300000 And then health insurance, this is um, through, I actually used January, which is the close of our open enrollment period. So this is based on that January open enrollment. We could potentially, um, pending any life events that change enrollment, there could potentially be 70, just over 71000 in savings on the health insurance line item also. Um, and then once we get through quarter three, we look at some of the other areas of the budget. But otherwise, on the expenditure side, we're just over 375000 in savings currently. And then on the revenue side, uh, we actually, you know, a celebration which Jeff and all have spoken about, um, the increase in our tuition students that we are receiving. So currently, we're just over 100000 of potential additional revenue pending all residency verifications come through um, in our tuition line item on the revenue side. So that's really exciting. And then obviously, on um, the interest income, we have um, a substantial increase there, and that's because we've had additional cash, so we haven't had to borrow as much on our tax anticipation note. So that allows that money that we get from the tax anticipation note to actually earn interest because it's not being drawn down from. So that's where we're seeing that additional interest income. And then we haven't had any rental fees come in that I'm aware of at this point in time, um, so there's no revenue projected for that one, um, same as the adult learning. But otherwise, the rest of the revenue should be consistent with what was budgeted. So overall, right now, we have a surplus projection in the revenue of 154000 just shy of 155, uh, expense just over 375. So overall right now we could potentially be looking at a surplus pending any changes of 530000 at the close of the fiscal year. And then down below on this last page, I've just updated those um, amounts and I've added in uh, fiscal year 23 because hopefully you'll take action on your audit tonight. Um, so I did put that information on here as well so that you have it. So the difference in the salary yep. currently is how many positions are we There's, looking to hire right now? What what are those? Yeah, so world language, we still have not been able to successfully fill here at the middle school. So there's savings there. Some ad other additional savings that you're seeing in salaries is still some of the leverage we that we're able to do with ESSER. Yep. So that's some of your savings, right? We're able to offset those costs. Um, and then the other part is, is just, frankly, like what we budgeted at based on current personnel last year versus where we hired at. Okay. Um, but it's not like just vacant positions. It's really ESSER, what, what, yeah. what's that? The world led. Yes, the world language here, yeah. and then also what we budget at versus Because remember, hired. when we do our budget, we build it based on staffing in that prior year. Right. All right, any questions on that? Hearing none, we will go to the policy committee update. Yeah, so we, we, we have two policies right now that we've been reviewing that are actually going to have pretty substantive uh, changes that will probably need two readings from boards. Uh, it's They're both personnel policies. It's the harassment policy. Um, and that policy... Um, hasn't been updated since 18, and there were some new laws, 2018, that, and there were some new laws that came into effect uh, 2020 to 2021. Um, and we also want to review it to ensure that it's in alignment um, with Title IX. And some of those changes have occurred between administrations in regards to guidance we've been getting from the um, U.S. Department of Ed. Uh, so our lawyers are working on that. And then our employee alcohol and drug-free workplace policy is actually going to turn into a more global policy by the looks around a fitness for duty policy. Um, there's a lot of discussion within the committee like, all right, we have um, alcohol and drug-free workplace, but what happens if someone was prescribed a prescription medication, but that that is resulting in the teacher really not being fit for duty? And our ability to then navigate that through policy 
um, in regards to making certain we are getting fitness for duty clearance. Meaning, you may actually be le using a legal substance, but it may be impairing your ability to do your work in front of kids. Um, and it could be that you know the prescription's off or something of that nature, right? That needs to be adjusted, and us having a policy on the books that allows us then to, to take action around that. Okay. Not that we wouldn't if we had a concern, right? But to be able to have it in policy that it's spelled out. <clears throat> okay, anything in regards to the policy committee? Okay, hearing none, we'll move forward. Uh, Facility Task Force update? Well, I mean, I, we haven't done anything since. Yeah. And, and part of it was um, it's just been really busy with um, budgets. But uh, the goal is, and it is a plan, that um, EEI will be back in front of the board at the March meeting um, with more dialed in numbers around uh, cost of the project that we've talked about, the expansion project, the safety. Um, and also improving um, air quality in the library at Royalton. And um, so I'm looking forward to that presentation. And they're also going to be providing us a real backwards design timeline around what the steps we need to take between now and uh, November in regards to um, having a warned uh, bond vote. Um, and so between now and that March meeting, the facility task force will meet too to review that budget so that we can give the board a better sense of like how those expenses would break out around total cost of the budget versus what's been fundraised, what we might want to use from our capital facilities um, fund to uh, use as a revenue source, um, and then what that bond might look like. Tara's run the numbers on the bond. She sent those out to the board. Um, but we'll have a dialed-in presentation for the board in March around all that. So it's exciting. I'm, I, I'm pretty excited about that. Will we have any numbers for the um, annual meeting? I mean, it'd be really nice to be able to present some of the stuff then when we have kind of our biggest audience. Um, I can ask kind of Eric. Uh, he was you. really looking at the March board meeting, but I can ask him to share what he's got. Yep. Yeah, I mean, I think it'd be really helpful to have that. He's got, I mean, he's he's already shared with us 10,000 foot numbers, so, yeah. Well, I, and, and I guess to piggyback on what Andrew was saying, is it may even be nice that, you know, to have some sort of little table set up with the yeah. proposed, you know. We've got the we've got the drawings and layouts. So. What it looks yeah. like, you know, so people can look at it, see it, at least. Um, yeah, it's yeah I, would, I would thank you by the music boosters to... Uh, you know, really, you know, they're really proud of the work that they've done, I think. So right. giving them an opportunity to present on it would be helpful, I think. We're good. Yeah, and I just think, and I'm only basing this off of my experience with another district uh, around this, is just making certain that our voters understand that night that there's nothing been budgeted for that. Sure, yeah. Mm -hmm. But we could have the performing arts team Absolutely. be there as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just think we need to make certain it, we say that it. during the meeting. Yeah. Yeah, it's great. I'll reach out to Eric tomorrow and copy you on it, Chris. Okay. Yeah, that's true. All right. Any other questions? Anything more on the task force update? On that, uh, let's see. Uh, community engagement task force update? Yeah, so uh, Mary Shaw, our community school coordinator, um, and I have been meeting on this to really map out um, in regards to once we form a committee, and the goal would be that we're going to try to form a committee in March too um, to really get going on this work. Um, and so Mary's been reaching out to some folks that she engages on a regular basis around community engagement. Um, I would ask the board to think about what two members might be interested to serve on that. I think it's going to be uh, initially um, some, like, you know, a couple times a month for the first few months to gain the survey data and then process it. Um, 
but I would really love with the idea that we have a, a, we get to work in March and that we are really analyzing a report in August um, is sort of the timeline her and I have been talking about. And remember, this was like about looking, reviewing like the articles of agreement, like are we meeting the goals of the merger, like gaining feedback from all different community stakeholders. You're all right, Peggy. Yeah, that we could talk about at the annual meeting, Andrew. Yeah, I think like having another table and being able to Recruiting people to join would be good. Yep, I agree. Are you interested in volunteers from the board at this point? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I thought you had said that, Nancy. <laughs> yeah, I think we could have two board members, um, and Nancy had indicated she was willing. So if there's another one, it'd be great for us to have that identified. And like I said, my goal is to have those list of names so that the board actually takes action on forming a committee at the March meeting. I know one thing that works really well uh, in Bethel, we do um, some questionnaires around town meeting day that we do through Survey Monkey. So that's definitely a good tool to have when you're conducting a survey for, you know, those that uh, are technologically savvy um, or mailer, you know. Yeah. Much easier to get it through Survey Monkey because people can't, people can't vote twice because they have a way of capturing your IP address so you can't put 10 of them in, but at the same time, it populates it for you, so you don't have to go through and count them all. And, you know. so. I think you just have to be really careful about the questions, yeah. because sure. too often with Survey Monkey, people just have yes, no as answers for choices, and there are a lot of things that yes, no does not cover. <laughs> Yeah, I think that's why taking some time here that like the you know the first four meetings to really dial in the questions will be important. Yeah. And I and Mary's working on it too. We definitely want some students on that group. Oh yeah. So it's you know, I think the challenge is like making certain we have a committee that's a workable size, but ensuring that we have a good cross section of stakeholders, meaning students, staff, right, board representation from both towns like and how do we get it to a place where we're able to hit all those stakeholders but it's not a committee that then spins it you know spins in place because we can't make decisions do you know what I mean like that it can actually be a functional working committee too so okay. uh, planning for the annual meeting Yeah, so we've got another informational meeting coming up, um, not next week, the week after. And that one's at Royalton, and that start time's at 7. Uh, it's in the mailer. Um, if board members have feedback on tweaks to the presentation, I think that that would be great to email uh, to Andrew and Tara. Um, and by then, we may... You know, one of the things we could do at that one, too, because we don't have a meeting afterwards, is that I do think we could have some numbers from EEI to put in that. Um, that could probably be really helpful for folks to see what, it, what we're even talking about for next year, what that cost is. That was something I had written down just from this past meeting, or from tonight. And then for the actual annual meeting, as I indicated earlier, um, we'll have the full presentation that has all the celebrations, that the administration contributes to it, and some more um, details in that one. We tried to just do the budget information meetings shorter and really to focus on the budget versus everything else that we celebrate during the annual meeting. Mm -hmm. And if all possible, the, the one thing that I would add to that the budget is if we have any um, sample budgets from other communities oh, that yeah, they're yeah, looking yeah. like, said that. it's always easier if we can compare to others, you yep. know. Do you want, are you looking Especially for when just you're within thinking our SU about, or are you looking for... Well, I mean, I think it's always nice to have a couple sample, pop, you know, from the SU, but then if you could say, you know, here's some outliers maybe, you know, like look at 
these communities. There's Washington at, Centrals. You know, mm -hmm. these ones. Um, it, it just puts it in perspective for people, I think, sometimes. I will and, add that slide. And then just definitely hit hard on the Context. common level of appraisal mm -hmm. education on that. That's great feedback. Jamie, on your Act 127 slide, one thing that's confused me, and I don't know if it's going to come up again, is on the new weights, kindergarten is a negative. Number. Yeah, I've explained on my Friday morning, we can ex okay. explicitly explain that more. Zero is actually one, um, but okay. how they read it, but I've emphasized that in the past, and I should have tonight. Thank you. Okay. Anything further on that? Supervisor Union Board configuration. Yeah, Andrew, do you want to talk about this? Sure. Yeah, I'll talk about it. Um, give me like 15 seconds just because um, we're, I just need to transition to where I am for this second. Um, you know, when the supervisor union was set up, it was basically set up when all the districts were individual districts, um, just individual towns, and all the districts that operated schools got three students or three board members as representatives, and all the um, non-operating districts got one. So it was a pretty simple setup. But since then. Um, there's been a lot of mergers, and so, you know, when our district merged, we went from having six between six representatives on the supervisory union uh, between Bethel and Royals and down to three. So basically, like our representation on the supervisory union was half, and the same thing's happened in FBUD and um, our side, and the town that didn't do anything, you know, wind up getting a greater representation. So it's, you know, there's that history there, and so um, they've passed a law basically saying that um, any town can request to have the state board reapportion um, members or, or representation at the, for a supervisory union, and. Um, they would do it based on population or something like that. So, um, what I brought this up for was just so that we could kind of like when it was when we it was brought up last. It was when we were the only district that emerged, and it was kind of not really talked about when we were. Um, there wasn't really much discussion then, so. You know, I really appreciate the way that the supervisory union has been working recently, and they've been very supportive of us in the district. So we definitely don't want to rock the boat on the supervisory union level. I, I think it's been really going well there, and the board as a whole is really functional. Um, but we do need to have a um, just start a process to look at what makes sense, rather than just kind of grandfathering in what is done. So. Um, I brought it up as a future agenda item the last meeting, so it will be coming up at the next meeting, but that's just my general thoughts on it. Um, I'd be curious to hear what other people here think and um, yeah, where, how we should approach it at the supervisory level. You know, I think some of the other districts are sensitive to, you know, we are kind of the larger, largest district, and they're sensitive to us trying to like throw our weight around as a largest district or something like that. So, and that's certainly not my intent with bringing this up. It's more just, you know, like it's something that should be discussed and we should have a discussion, you know, it's, there should be a process to figure out what makes sense now that we kind of have a new configuration. And there probably should be a policy that like when things change, like we, have to go through the process again so that it's not just like, you know, kind of a fixed um, thing. And part of the process can also be looking at like how many members make sense, what 
do we need for forums, how many um, people are we likely to get from different districts, and that sort of thing. So uh, that's where I was at with this um, topic. But I'd be curious to hear from others on their thoughts. So, a Andrew, you, you may know or not know, but what, what would that look like, or what would the difference if we were to weight it by um, population, let's say, what would the, be the difference on representation to the board versus now, do you think? I mean, I think right now we're, our assessment, which is somewhat based on student population, is like 43%, um, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Terry or Jane. I think it's um, 38. So, 38, okay. Yeah. But still somewhere around, you know, 40% is what Yeah, 40, it's yeah. always right around that 40. Around 40. And yeah. what is our current yeah. representation percentage to the board or to the SU? It's 3 out of 16. Oh. So, not, not 40%, though. <laughs> Nowhere's near. <laughs> yeah, and I'm not saying that we necessarily need to have, you know, I don't think we need to have 40% necessarily, but... Um, right. You know, just that we should be looking at what makes sense and kind of have a process at the SU board level where people can chime in and, and kind of, you know, come up with a, a plan or some sort of something that makes sense. Are, are there, Jamie, are there other examples and other issues on how maybe they've dealt with these challenges? Yeah, you know, I'll, I, um, I'll reach out to some other superintendent colleagues to see if they've made some changes that's not from the standard, um, like representation of like each district board gets so many. Um, I know that this conversation came up recently at Central Vermont Supervisory Union, which is where I used to work, um, where they have Payne Mountain School District, which is Northfield Williamstown. And then they have a, another district, Echo Valley, which is uh, Washington. Orange and Washington, right? And so that is um, that ratio is even more skewed in regards to population. But at the SU level, each one of those districts have equal representation. Um, and so there was um, Payne Mountain had looked into going to actually to the state board because they were not at a place um, where they were ready to change it. Uh, by mutual agreement um, and the way it works at the state board level is that a district votes to moves to take action to move it to the state board and then the state board actually sets up a hearing uh, where each member district would um, essentially plead their case on how, why they felt that it would should be one weight versus another they chose not to do that uh, but I'll reach out to other supervisory union superintendents to get a sense of what other mechanisms maybe they've used. And then I could come back in March, yeah, and talk about what I found out too. It's going to be on the full board agenda as well. Um, you know, I would say, you know, and I've spoken to Andrew about this, my concern is, is just approaching this conversation at the full board level where it feels like we're approaching it around like just re-looking at it and being uh, like open to just reflecting on what's working and then also thinking about how we might want to go about it differently. Because I do worry about the fact that I think we're pretty interdependent now and that the districts are really supporting each other. Um, and the fact that the full board has 16 members and we tend to only get nine to 10 most nights. Um, just making certain that, you know, we have members that are dedicated to be there that, you know, that want to support one another. Um, you know, I think for the first time in a long time in the supervisory union that our, our member district boards are very uh, thoughtful and supportive around trying to promote your high school and your middle school. Um, and that wasn't always the case in the very recent future. Right, uh, uh, past, sorry, <laughs> recent past. So, um, and I think Andrew's being really thoughtful around this, but I think the first thing is just, just talking to this district board around it, because I think um, having some consensus around the why to it um, is important prior to going in front of the full board. Sure. 
one thing I would say is that, you know, I, I very much appreciate how they, the rest of the districts <coughs> have been working really well together. And I think that while we're working well together is the time to have this conversation when we're not, we don't have these other kind of rivalries or whatever going on when we can have a productive conversation about this kind of, you know, potentially touchy subject. Um, and hopefully come to something that make, you know, is mutually agreed upon and, and everybody agrees with. So, you know, I, I, I will, when we bring it up there, definitely, you know, bring up that I'm very much appreciative of how the board has been working and like that they are do seem to be supporting our district and you know really it's been a very productive board at the supervisory union and I you know we don't want to rock that boat so um, but yeah I think that the time to have the discussion is when you know not when we're at loggerheads of, over some something else like when we are working together and all want the best for each other you know sure so the idea there is we'll just leave that as an ongoing discussion item mm -hmm. okay. all right any further discussion on that item this evening Rodney yeah uh, on the Board vote. I, I mean, I just don't think we should change it, right? I don't see really any need. I, I just feel that it's been going along, it's been going smooth, and why, why change it? I mean, all the votes. We've never had an issue. With not everything going our way. And like, the other thing I kind of think is that we, we've got the only high school in the whole supervisory union, and the full board is the only time that the other districts have any say, in it, I guess, in what's going on in the in the high school, and, you know, and then if we limit that, it's, you know, and sometimes I even think that we should have, like, other districts not really be on our board, but maybe have a high school somewhere where they could put their opinion in, you know, and, and ask things, because that way we could uh, help recruit more students, and, uh, I just think if we, I don't know, I just don't want to limit their um, voting power, I guess, and, and whatever. So I, I, I just don't keep it just the way it is. That's my opinion. Okay, thanks for adding. So it sounds like we're just going to do, um, do an exercise into what maybe it could look like and and then you know we can talk about it at the board level if we want to pursue anything or not does that sound right andrew yeah i mean i think the uh, um i mean we'll see what the full board wants to, talk, wants to do i mean um i i'm certainly not anticipating that like we're going to wind up with like six representatives and everybody else is going to have three and so we're going to just be able to dominate that board like that's not what's going to happen and it's not the goal and um, you know I think there's just been a lot of change in the supervisory union so it makes sense to have a process to see what makes sense for representation mm -hmm. and you know if it is something that everybody else is getting really upset about then you know that's good to know and we can see what like I, I, I don't we probably drop it or something but you know, if it is something that other people there are willing to talk about and want to, um, you know, come up with something different, then we'll see where that goes. Sounds good. I do, I do think, you know, like, we do have some constituents that are, um, you know, very touchy about the supervisor union in general and the board representation for it and stuff like that. So, you know, I do think if we just leave it as it is, we'll have some people who are upset. Whereas if we have some sort of process to go about, you know, even if it's not like, you know, exact population representation or whatever, like if there's 
some sort of thought behind how it is, and it's not just like this is how it's always been, so this is how it should be. Um, I think that'll make people happy. Okay. All right. Anything further on that? Okay, so we'll move forward with the FY23 audit. So I sent you all included, I didn't have it printed because it's a lot of paper. Um, I sent you all through my board report um, and in the packet is just the cover memo. But I also shared with you um, a PowerPoint for people who are new to audits and may not have um, experience on actually what you want to look at outside of my memo. Yep. So I shared that PowerPoint presentation on what boards should look at in their <coughs> audits as well as the draft um, financial statements from the auditors. So the points that I wanted to point out to you all are on page 13 of the audit, which are your balance sheets for your governmental funds. The assigned in that section is the $200,000 of surplus funds being used as offsetting revenue in the current fiscal year 24 budget. And then your unassigned funds are the surplus funds, as we had talked about in our budget presentation, um, that are available for you to either allocate as offsetting revenue or to request from your voters to move that money to the surplus funds. So based on all of our budget conversations, you know, our directive here at this board is to use those funds to put into surplus and not set ourselves up for a revenue shortfall if you don't have surplus funds available in the next fiscal year. Um, so not to use it as offsetting revenue. So that, se that page is an important page to look at. Um, the second page that I like to point out is your statement of revenues, expenditures, and change in fund balance. And so that's where these numbers come from. So in fiscal year 23, your overall general fund surplus was $1,337,952. And then um, we back out um, any changes in any prior year and any offsetting funds. So that actually brought it down to a leaving a fund balance of $1,197,660, which again, the 200,000 of that is assigned and the 997 is what's unassigned. So that's where those numbers come from. And then the next page that's really important um, and which gives you the story of where that money comes from is on page 55, which is your schedule of um, budget to actuals by function code or by department. Um, which, if you look at your budgets, we do it by function code. In the audit, it just gives you the description of the department. And then that shows you the areas of surplus and deficits by department. And then the most important page is page 74 to 75, which is the independent auditor's report on internal control over financial reporting and compliance. And on page 75 of the audit, the sentence says, the results of our test disclose no instances of non-compliance or other matters that are required to be reported under government auditing standards, which means we had no findings. So that's our ultimate goal in the business office is to not have findings. So it's very exciting. Mm -hmm. And then if there's any questions or if you want to go through the audit page by page, happy to do that with you. Just give me a call. You send me an email. Love talking about audit just as much as I love talking about budget. So. <laughs> You are a true math nerd. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't a math nerd in school. <laughs> so yes, it's definitely, but this is, you know, I have an amazing team in the business office. We have amazing administrators who are very budget conscious and are trying to do right by our budgets. So that's what allows me to come to you and to report this information. So this is definitely an absolute team effort by all parties involved. And it just goes to show the, the power of having cash right now. And, I mean, any short-term borrowing right now is expensive. And yeah, not, not to mention we're not having to borrow, but we're also collecting some interest. And, you know, I, I will say a dozen years ago that wasn't to be had of. So it's, um, especially with interest rates, you're getting in the 5 5.5% five to, to do anything right now at, at our level. That's, that's a lot of money when you start borrowing you know, large amounts of cash like we had in the past. So. so we just need a motion to accept. Accept. So is that, can I say it just like that? Motion to accept the fiscal year, the fiscal year 23 audit as dictated to us by Tara, the business manager. Second. 
Okay, any discussion further? Thank you. Thank you. Okay, you're none. Um, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, Aye. Aye. All right, <clears throat> and then uh, we'll just go back. If there's any other public comment at this time, if anybody's left, we all gone to bed. <laughs> anybody's left that would like to do it? Any chance? I think it's just you, Tammy. Other than that, she's good. Any new hires or resignations? Didn't have anything. No, but um, we may. We are starting to post on some positions where we've known if, if somebody was like retiring. Um, and so we may have a new, we could have new hires soon. Meaning like next month. No, we're not waiting to post is what I'm trying to say to you. Mm -hmm. Like, um, and so we're trying to get out in front of the hiring curve. If that is the case, if someone's indicated to us. So um, next month there may be something there, but Stay tuned. All right. <clears throat> Future agenda items. Uh, there'll be the um, the community engagement task force will be on there. We'll have reorg uh, <coughs> meeting in March. Um, the supervisory union board configuration will be on there again. And anything else, just email Andrew or I. <coughs> oh, and EI will be presenting on the, the, the expansion project. <coughs> um, next meeting dates, we have 28th of February, March 4th, and March 19th. So. Anything further? Just need motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Second. <clears throat> Thanks for having the meeting, Chris. No problem.